Hello, thank you to the organizers of this conference for inviting me to give this presentation today on their unique challenges in integrating injectable regimens during social distancing. While my own experience has been shaped by working at a community health center in Washington, DC in the United States, I hope that you leave this presentation today with thoughts about how you can integrate this new therapeutic option for patients into your own clinical sessions. Here are my conflicts of interest. My organization receives grants and research funding from pharmaceutical agencies listed here. And I my organization received stipend for this presentation. And I have served on advisory boards for View Healthcare and Gilead Sciences. I like to start every discussion I have, especially even now around HIV, with the ultimate goal, which is ending the HIV epidemic. And here I just place two different plans one of which is the United Kingdom's plan, and the other one is the, is the plan to end the HIV epidemic, a plan for America and the United States. And the focus of today's talk is going to be around that 90% on HIV treatment to get 90% virally suppressed. While the UK has had more success on that front than the United States, I'm sure many of the same barriers to medication uptake and adherence are the same, and that COVID-19 pandemic has widened some of those barriers and inequities. One hope is a development of new novel therapeutics will be able to offer increased access, patient choice, and flexible options for patients that best fit their lives. I wanna start with a brief review of how we got here and then also keep in mind what's to come because this is just the first step in, a, in, a, in hopefully a long line of many new medications and many new options for patients. First, let's talk about long-acting oral medications. Islatrovir is a once-weekly oral nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. It's currently in trials for pre prevention of HIV and treatment in combination with deravirine. Moving on to injectables, the GS6207 HIV capsid inhibitor is a subcutaneous injection that's in currently finishing phase two testing, moving on to phase three. And it may offer 12-week or even six-month dosing, both for prevention and for treatment. We're going to focus today mostly around the two intramuscular injections, cabotegravir and rupivirine, both of which are at various stages in regulatory review. I believe Canada has given it regulatory approval. The UK and the United States are, are still in review. But both of them are in open label extensions for treatment in phase three studies for treatment and for prevention. Recently, there was data released from the HPTN studies, um, 083084 on prevention in cabotegravir, which is very exciting and, and a great option for the future. I'm not gonna talk much, but I want you to think about the other ideas that are, are currently in circulation, such as implants and infusions, broadly neutralizing antibodies are in clinical trials, early phase clinical trials, both for prevention and treatment. And also keep in mind where these all might come into play for uh, vaccinations and eventual cure, which is also in the hope and the dreams for the next few years. Focusing on cabotegravir and rupivirine, I want to talk a little bit about the studies that brought us to regulatory review and hopefully approval soon. First is the ATLAS study. It's a switch study, which means that patients were exper treatment experienced already on medications and switched over to getting 50-50 injectable or continue their oral regimen. What they found was that 48 weeks long-acting cabotegravir and rupivirine was non-inferior to patients' oral antiretroviral therapy, which is amazing. They did see a fair amount of injection site reactions, so 83% of the cabotegravir recovering group, but only 1% withdrew because of the injection site reactions. And even with those injection site reactions, they saw great treatment satisfaction in the cab recovering group, where 86% preferred injectable over daily oral therapy. This made sense to me when I talked to patients. They've been on, a lot of them have been on oral regimens for a long time, and getting freedom, even if they had to come in once a month, um, was still something that they really enjoyed. And keep in mind that all of these studies involved an oral lead-in for at least 30 days where patients took oral cabotegravir before they were able to switch and, and rapovirine before they were able to switch over. The next study that's really interesting and something to think about and keep in your mind is the Atlas 2M. So what happens if you go from going with an injection every four weeks, can you have it every eight weeks? And what they found was every eight week cabotegravir rapovirine was not inferior to every, few, every four weeks, which means that maybe the potential is to stretch out those injections um, between for to every two months, which would be amazing. As you can imagine, 94% of people enjoyed the Q8 week versus the Q4 week. And the injection site reactions were still seen on all these patients. They were deemed mild and moderate, and the mean duration was three days. However, it was uh, very highly regarded. 
as I mentioned, it didn't really come to much surprise to me as a clinician that patients really enjoyed switching from oral medications to injectables and they had high treatment satisfaction as part of it. But what about treatment naive patients? So that's where FLARE comes in. So first the FLARE study took 618 treatment naive adults living with HIV and they were all given 20 weeks of an oral regimen. Those who were virologically suppressed at, at 20 weeks were randomly assigned to either switch to oral cabotegravir or quivirin for four weeks and then monthly injections or to stay in their in initial regimen. 86% saw injection site reactions in the cabotegravir or recovering arm, but only 1.4% withdrew because of those reactions, similar to the 1% we saw in the SWITCH study ATLAS I talked about earlier. And overall, still 91% preferred injectable over daily oral therapy. The overall take home message, I think in all of this is patient choice when it comes to antiretroviral regimen and to consider involve the patient whenever at all possible. However, with this new therapy that we've built a system around oral medications, we know how to encourage adherence, we know how to support ongoing retention, all of those things, how do we now pivot to include injectable therapy in the part of that? What is the potential for the disruption to clinic flow? A way to think about it, or a way I think about it is from a process flow perspective, or you can use an implementation framework like the one on the screen here. It allows you to guide your process and really think through each step. So to maximize your success, you need advanced planning, leadership and stakeholder buy-in, and a full understanding of your current processes, especially those that in, now that COVID-19 has impacted your flow in such ways now. Are you calling patients a day before their visits to screen for symptoms? What if there are more nursing visits than before? Is there space and staff to accept them? Is there staff to screen those patients? I recommend walking you and your staff through the process and identifying potential bottlenecks or disruptions. I'll go through a few possibilities and I encourage you to keep your own clinic flow and your own patient flow in mind when I go through these. A brief review in, of some of the unique challenges with long acting cabotegravir. Many of the same challenges exist with ropivirine with the exception of the tail, but ropivirine also has the, an, another challenge where it needs to be kept frozen or cold chain storage. So just thinking through how you store it and how you administer it is key. First, I mentioned, we still have the induction period on oral lead in therapy. So that means that many of the adherent support tools and the other retention support tools you need just like any other antiretroviral regimen. So we have to support initial medication adherence and uptake. Also with cabotegravir, you have the possibility of a long tail after treatment discontinuation and or interruption. This can lead to possible development of integrase resistance. You need to think through what discontinuation looks like and during the pandemic, what breaks in drug access might look like. New enhanced risks to the idea of loss to follow up. We worried about people coming off care before but now if people come off care and they have this waning tail that increases the chance of resistant virus to develop, what does that look like and how do we increase support? Sites will also have to think through training on how to have the discussions around side effects. Counseling on them pre and post is gonna be key. Manage patients' expectations, let people know what to expect and how long to expect the injections to last. A lot of the clinical trial results showed high treatment satisfaction scores, which is amazing. But we also know that people engaged in clinical trials are not always the same patients we see every day in clinic. So that leads me to my last question is even also of great importance, who will have access to this medication? Will it be our clients who report high levels of adherence like the clinical trials did? Or will it be those that struggle with their oral regimen? Who is this best fit for? To not worsen health inequities in access, Sites will have to invest in internal process evaluations and identify tools that support the clients that they uniquely care for. Because each client in each program sees a unique set of clients. And so it's just really important to understand how to best support those that we care for. Now, how does COVID-19 complicate our HIV care? We are months into this. All of, it, all of us have experienced dramatic, drastic changes in our clinics and our lives and how we offer care. Some of that has been seen and met with teamwork and innovation and flexibility and all of those I hope will be transferable into this. A few points to consider. Protective behaviors for COVID may be impacting our patients living with HIV. These may be new to them. You may, and for the first time, they may have food insecurity. They may have barriers to accessing medications and decreased ability to access their own healthcare 
or disru disrupted social services that have been there and supported them through all this time. It's important to identify new COVID related barriers to care, even with our long established patients. Use the trust and build off the trust that we have from many years of working with them to be flexible and patient centered. And this allows for optimization of patient health outcomes. I've listed one reference, but there's many that have looked into different health outcomes and the effect of, of COVID on health seeking behaviors. We know that it's important for programs to look at and prepare for potential spikes in transmission in, in, in our communities and in our programs. And it's vital to have backup plans in place. A good place to start is to assess your program's potential needs related to PPE and other supplies to control and mitigate the spread of the virus, staff training, staff support, technology to support telehealth, and the flexibility to move between models. I know a lot of clinics are doing more hybrid-based care and just seeking ways to be more flexible over time is key. When I think through in-person visits and what that looks like when choosing an antiretroviral during COVID, there's several factors that play into it even before we talk about medication choice. So is the patient currently experiencing any symptoms consistent with COVID? Has the patient had any known exposure to an individual who has tested positive or suspected of having COVID? What is the risk to the specific patient associated with an in-person visit? Are they or someone they live or care for at high risk for severe COVID-19 illness? When thinking through ARV choices, it's important to have these conversations with your, your clients and your patients sitting in front of you. Now keep in mind that the long-acting cabotegravir and piperin regimen will involve most likely at least double in-person visits. So you have to think through what that would mean for the patient. Even during the pandemic though, it is important to keep patient preference and choice at the forefront. What formulary does that patient prefer? What is their level of anxiety coming in? Even if they're at low risk for developing severe COVID-19 symptoms, if they're anxious or concerned, they're more likely to miss injections and follow up. Really prepare the patient for the choice on the anticipated requirements for in-person appointments for each possible ARV regimen. Does your facility have sufficient staff space for social distancing and PPE to accommodate in-person visits and or injections? That's probably the most important question to ask. Does your staff have plans in place to pre-screen for COVID-19 symptoms and backup plans if those exist? I had mentioned that there would probably be more visits with the injectable regimens. It probably is moving from three to four visits a year for a lot of our routine follow-up patients to six to as many as 12, depending on what formulary and what administration is approved based on your regulatory boards. This may not be of impact to everyone on this talk, but for me, many times I have to think about, will insurance cover this formulary? And is there staff time available to track appointments, to do counseling on side effects? to reach out to patients when they don't come to their appointments and try and loop back, back into care? Is there staff available to support adherence and retention support? This can be an extension of ongoing programs. We have a mobile team who may be used to administer injections in the field. Is this something that's an option to you? Is this something that's possible during COVID? Think through all the things you all have already and then kind of monitor and pivot and change based on what you the new technology in your hands. Is the facility able to obtain, deliver, and bill for the injections? Is staff adequately trained on giving injections? And I think the big question is, what is the availability of medications once they're approved? Is there an issue with the supply chain? Do you have an issue with supply chains now? Early on in the pandemic, we had to think through PPE shortage and other supply chain shortage. What does that look like now? And what does it look like in the next six months for you? Is there an ability for oral formulary to bridge or cover gaps? As I mentioned, the risk of an antiretroviral interruption in the long tail with cabotegravir increased the concern for developing resistant virus. I included an image from a recent presentation by Aviv Healthcare at ID Week a few weeks ago that offers a visualization of what treatment interruption could look like. Based on the site response to COVID-19, and maybe that there is new shelter in place order or a patient is not able to come in for their visit, a bridge of oral cab lopriverine should be used to maintain viral suppression and antiretroviral levels. I hinted to this at my last slide, but thank you to Monty Collins at Beeb for sharing these. Beeb compiled a summary of the COVID-related impact on cabotegravir and lopriverine across six ongoing clinical trials. Overall, as you can see, many were able to maintain their normal schedule of four-week or Q eight-week injections, but those that had to were able to bridge with oral therapy um, either cabotegravir and rapivirine or addition, another oral antiretroviral therapy. At our site, we bridge people 
for a few weeks, a few months with oral cab and loperivine, and then everyone was very grateful to go back on the study. Also, the data presented by DLEAP was that there was no instances of virologic failure among participants with COVID-19 impacted visits. This flexibility of the dosing regimen was able to facilitate continuous ART provision during the global pandemic. In conclusion, novel therapies require site-specific process evaluation to ensure success. It's important to be flexible and thoughtful, and that will pay off down the road. Pandemic control measures and COVID complicate delivery, but site-specific evaluation plans using patient-centered approaches, this can be a very highly successful approach. As I mentioned, backup plans for clinics to retain medication access and limit treatment interruptions are vital. And some of those interruptions can be due to shelter in place, worsening infection rates, PPE shortages. Thinking through and preparing for all of those will allow for continued viral suppression and ensuring support for people living with HIV. I want to thank you for your time and attention. Thanks again to the organizers. And if anyone has any questions, I've included my email address here.